Einen wunderschönen guten Morgen wünsche ich euch. So, wonderful good morning. It's wonderful to see you. It's wonderful to be here in the Ecclesia Church here in Göttingen, and it's just great to see everyone here. I am privileged to be able to give the message today. We are still in this sermon series called Summer in the Ecclesia. And I think that's a pretty good title because it seems like uh, summer has come back <laughs> pretty strongly. It's it's really hot today. And um, it's pretty hot today. But I, like I do before every sermon, I, I prayed and I asked God, you know, what would be the good topic to preach today? And fairly quickly, I, I had the idea that 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 I should preach about a certain topic, a certain word. And and it's very, very important for the people that believe in him. But we don't always have the right meaning or, or deal with it properly. So I'd like to start by asking you a question. And the question is this, do you believe that God is fair? Who is in me? What do you think? You know, fairness, it's a very high value in our society. And, and it shows that we have an idea of what justice is and what, what fairness should look like. Maybe when you're shopping, you look for the fair trade seal or logo on your food because that means that the products that you're buying, that, that they were the producers and the middlemen in the supply chain, that everyone paid and received fair treatment. It might not be cheap because of all of this, but it's fair. There's also a, a political talk show called Tough But Fair. And and they take dis topics of discussions that aren't so easy, and but they try to the objective and fair on how they handle it. So what what do we say is, is the meaning of fair? What is the definition? Well, the Duden Dictionary, that's uh, the main one here in Germany, talks about two different meanings. The first one is that you follow the rules of social norms, that you're just, you're being honest and impartial in your dealings. For example, we say that was a fair trial. I was treating you fairly. That wasn't very fair of him, or you're treating someone else fairly, being fair to somebody. The second meaning is in the world of sports. When you talk about sports, you talk about fair play, meaning that we followed the rules of the game and showed sportsmanship in our conduct, such as fairness and respect for your opponents and being gracious when you win or lose. And this is the way you're supposed to act when you're participating in a, in a sport. So examples are a fair competition or saying somebody doesn't always play fair. So somebody's playing soccer fairly when they, when they play according to the rules, right? And it would be unfair if they wouldn't be punished, given a penalty if they didn't, right? Because our sense of justice that is in all of us screams unfair. As soon as we seem like there's some something that's going on that isn't right, we all have some sort of an antenna with it in us, and we say, "Hey, this isn't. You didn't see that. And there's foul play. There's cheating. There's verbal insults that are out of order." It would be totally unfair if people would do these things and nobody would would give them a penalty for that, right? I mean, that wouldn't be fair. Everything should be fair. Everybody should be treated the same, right? Democratic, all following the same rules. So let's ask again. Do you think God is fair? You know, 
it's kind of nasty. I, I was being hard on you because I didn't tell you what the topic is. And I believe that it's not easy to give just a simple yes or no for this particular topic. So what do I mean by that? I believe that God is fair because he made everyone in his image and he loves them all the same amount. Again, he also gave us the same amount of time. We all have 24 hours a day. And, and we all have the same weather. Uh, it's not just one person gets all the sunshine and the next person right next to him gets all the rain. I mean, if it's going to be sunny, everybody in that area gets the sun, right? Everybody gets the rain. And so another thing that's fair is that he gives his invitation to be saved by his son, Jesus Christ. He gives his invitation to everyone. And he doesn't say, oh, you can't have this. This is only for a certain bunch. No, that's not true. Everyone is allowed to have it. But it's, it's going to get a little bit complicated. This invitation of being able to receive salvation is only possible because God is being unfair with how he deals with our sin. Now think about it. We have sin, and the sin is not playing by the rules, right? The sin deserves a penalty. But God gives us a chance to receive the invitation to have that taken care of. So it's not there. And what is the thing that does this? Grace. Grace. That's what we're talking about today. It's a, it's a, a term in the Hebrew language that talks about, uh, it has a, a different, a lot of different components in it. For example, goodwill or kindness, favor. Another word that we don't use too much anymore, it's kind of archaic, is comeliness or beauty. And this word, shin, I hope I pronounced it right, is also the name that Hannah came from. It's, it's derived from that. And that means graceful, favored, beautiful. In the, the first time we see this mentioned, it's all, when you read literature, it's always interesting where the or term or person or whatever the first mention. So if we look at the first place that this word is mentioned, it's it's very in the very beginning of the Bible. God made man according to his image, as man and woman. He made them. He put them in a wonderful garden of Eden. He gave them everything they needed. He gave them also something to do. And he wanted to have fellowship with him. And people decided though could kind of do their own thing, right? And so then they sinned. And then the the evil that happened because of this, it just started getting worse and worse. And, and God decided he couldn't take it anymore and he was going to send the big flood, right? If you know the Bible a bit, you know that. And it says in Genesis 6 verse 8, Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. And it even calls Noah a righteous man without blame in the next verse, verse 9. And Noah was a righteous man without blame. And Enoch, who is mentioned in a chapter before, in chapter 5, verse 22, he was, he was also mentioned that he was without blame. And those are the only two people in the Bible that are talked about is saying they walked with God. So if you read this perfectly wonderful description of Noah, you would think, wow, he earned the right not only to be warned about this terrible flood that was coming, but also to be able to, to survive it. I mean, 
God must automatically take care of somebody who lives such a flawless life, don't you think? But Noah wasn't a perfect person. He wasn't the perfect person. The only one who was was Jesus. And if God had wanted to find something to knock him down that he could have brought as a, as a sentence against him, he could have. It would have been very easy for him. But God decided to give him grace. And grace puts a but in the, in the equation. So you have what you earned, but you're not going to get it because there's grace. God gives a higher thing. If God would be fair, oh my goodness, what what would we earn? I mean, terrible. Let's let's think about this. Let's let's think. Okay, there's a God that made a man, and so it would be according to normal logic that if somebody made something, the the person that's doing the creating can make the rules about how the things work that he created, right? So we even see that in people. People, parents, create children. And because the parents, of course, we know that children are also a gift to the Lord, but, but they're given into the hands of these parents. And, and these parents have a responsibility, they feel a responsibility, and they set down the rules of the road. And and they, hey, my kid is going to come home after school, and they're going to do their homework, and they're not going to hang around who knows where. And, you know, they, they're they going to be making sure that things are, are going well. They want to be able to to train and educate their children. They want to give their values to their children. And not that someone else does it in a way that displeases them. So let's let's think that just like children can have bad behavior, they can be disobedient. There are consequences then, right? So if we think that's self-understood, that children would have consequences for misbehaving, then, of course, the Creator would be able to give us consequences as creation if, if we don't follow the rules. But you know, he could. He really could. It says in Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. He has every right, every right to destroy us completely, to judge us, to send us wherever he wants to because of the things that we've done. But God says, no, the grace is going to be more important to me than anything bad that they've done. But we have to realize, we have to realize that we can never stand in front of God, a holy God, in our own strength and our own good deeds. We're never going to make it. We're not going to make the, the grave. We're not, we're not good enough, even if we try. And just because of this, God had grace, and he had his son, Jesus Christ, become a perfect sacrifice for us to take our, our sin, the things we've done wrong, to take all of this imperfection and, and to take care of it. He took that so that we could have his perfection in God's eyes. And, and this is just like in the old covenant, there used to be animals that were sacrificed 
so that the sins of the of the community would be taken care of in God's eyes. And Jesus did this for us. He was the perfect sacrifice. Paul writes to the church in Galatians, chapter 5, verse 13, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. But don't use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. You know, we could say, oh, yeah, God's got so much grace. He's so forgiving. He's so wonderful. It doesn't matter. I, I, I can just do my thing here. This is too hard what he wants of me here. I'll just, I'll just sit here and I can always go back and get some more forgiveness, you know? You know, you know, it says in Lamentations, because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. You know, it would be terrible to take advantage of that. To, to just go ahead and sin, just to do whatever I want and say, oh, well, God will give us forgiveness. You know, that would be abnormal. That would be really psychological, a, a little bit, you know, off balance. And it would be definite abuse of the grace of God. You've probably heard of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He was a theologian and a resistance fighter. Uh, during the Nazi regime, and he talked a lot about grace. He wrote that the church has to count the cost. He sees the abusive use of God's grace stemming from a false understanding of it. Abuse occurs when grace is seen as cheap. Not only individuals can do this, but also churches can abuse the grace of God. He also said a very good quote, cheap grace is the arch enemy of our church. And he explains it like this. Cheap grace means grace is a cheap good. It's cheap forgiveness, cheap comfort, cheap sacrament. Grace is an inexhaustible supply of the church from which hands can dish out frivolously and without much thought in an unlimited amount. And grace like this is seen as coming without any price, without any cost. Yeah. I'd like to illustrate this with something that we used to do when I was in seminary. We used to play table soccer where the players are figures that twirl around on rods suspended over a table to kick the ball to the proper end goal. And, you know, guys can get really intense with even these games. And so they'd be really intensely trying to get this ball over to the goal and kind of like a pool table. And sometimes they had a horrible day and they they didn't get any points and, and played very poorly. And, and so somebody would say, oh, you're such a table full of gifts. And and you wouldn't understand what that means, but it, in our laundry room of that building, there was a table where everything that the students or housekeeping personnel had donated, they put it on top of this table. And anybody could take anything from it. They didn't have to ask permission. They didn't have to give anything in payment. It was just a presence that didn't cost you anything. And so that means that in this context, when they said you're a table full of gifts, it means you played so horribly that is is absolutely of no worth. Nobody would even want it if it were completely free, like the things on the gift table. Isn't that a compliment? A bunch of sweethearts. But you know, going back to Bonhoeffer, what he meant is that we often act like we think like God's grace was on such a gift table. And it didn't cost him, didn't cost me certainly anything, and it didn't cost him or anyone else anything. 
And that's kind of like if I see some trash on the on the parkway on the side of the road, waiting for the trash pickup. Maybe it's a, a table that's got a broken leg or a computer that doesn't work or who knows. You know? And and so I could pick it up and take it home if I wanted to repair it or use it for something. But it's it's kind of like a piece of trash. And if if you don't if you get it for nothing, like from the trash on the side of the road, you don't treat it very well, maybe. But if it would be a precious metal like gold, of course you would. If you had to pay money for it, you would protect it, boy. You might hide it. You might, you know, you'd do something with it. And this grease of God, you can never find on a trash heap. It's not on the gift table. And don't forget that it costs God everything in order to make this possible. It was not cheap. It was paid with a very high price, namely the precious blood of Jesus Christ. God's divine pardon of our sins and his consequences cost his only son, Jesus Christ, his life, so that we could be ransomed from death and receive true life. Everyone that treats this divine grace as if it's a free gift on the gift table is treating it like a cheap piece of trash. Another aspect we need to think about is grace can only be given as a gift. Each token of God's favor is undeserved. There's nothing we can do to earn it or it wouldn't be grace. God's grace means we cannot have any prerequisites, we can't have any conditions that first have to be met in order to receive it. The next thing is it's in the contents of a relationship. It's bestowed upon someone. It is given. That means that there's someone who's doing the giving and there's someone who receives the gifts. And so you could logically think, we can't give ourselves grace because we don't have the right to do so. Grace can only be extended by someone who also has the right to condemn. God, God will judge. Therefore, only he can pardon. But thankfully, right now, God abstains from handing us a just punishment, and he allows mercy to prevail. Right now, we live in a period of grace, but the time for judgment will also come. You know, it's it's so incomprehensible, and it, it, it's, it's actually so simple that people stumble on it, and they don't know what to do with it. They, they have trouble accepting this, and they say, oh, it can't be that God wants to forgive me. He, he wants to save me, and I don't have to do anything more than just to believe on his son, Jesus Christ, and accept this. But yeah, that's all it is. But, you know, the Bible also said that this would happen. In 1 Corinthians 1.18, it says, The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, notice the process here, are being saved. It is the power of God. Don't let yourself be deterred from accepting this offer of salvation just because it seems too simple. Dear friends, we're saved by grace and through believing and faith. There's no other way to God, just this one. And a wonderful quote here. Trust the past to God's grace, the present to his love, and the future to his provision. I would like to extend 
an invitation to us all, but I am not personally inviting. It is God himself who is inviting it through his word, the Bible. It says in Hebrews 4.16, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we might receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Have you ever experienced God as a, as a grateful, merciful king? Or, or do you think he's a father that's trying to punish you, that's looking for a chance to catch you doing something wrong? We have to maybe change our image of who God is. He's a king, yes, but he's full of grace. He's full of mercy. We are allowed to come into his divine presence and we may count on his grace. And we may do that together. You don't have to go any place for this. You can do it in your innermost being, in your spirit. And we'd like to do this together. I'd like to invite you right now. Just close your eyes, please. God is inviting you personally, my child, come in my presence and experience me. I would like to ask you, would you like to accept the saving grace of God for your life? You know, God is fair as far as giving us this offer, but he is unfair because he lets grace be more important than a punishment that's deserved. Say in your heart, yes, I believe in Jesus Christ, your son, and please forgive me. You can pray that in your heart and God will be gracious. He will be merciful to you. The second question is, do you have anything where you'd like to ask God for forgiveness? Maybe you've played around with God's grace because you know he's forgiving. Maybe you have a favorite sin. But there's still grace for you. There is still an opportunity to ask for forgiveness and take grace seriously and take God seriously and get right with God. I'm going to give you a moment to speak to God from, from the innermost of your heart. Father, I want to thank you that you're such a fair God. I thank you that this opportunity is for every person, everyone that's living, that's here on earth. You came to save each one here. Whether they're here in this room, whether they're watching online, whether they're in a palace, you offer your, your salvation to each one. And I thank you that you've placed your grace so much above 
everything that we've done wrong. And, and I thank you that you sent your son to, to help us live a perfect, perfect life in your eyes. And we can come to you even if we haven't been perfect, and if we've disrespected what you wanted, and you will forgive us. And in a spiritual sense, we're opening our arms and we're accepting this present that you're giving us. And we don't want to ever forget that it cost you everything, that it cost you your beloved son. Jesus went to the cross so that we can live in freedom. We are allowed to accept it, but it costs you everything. And so we want to regard it as being very, very precious. And your grace is the most precious thing we have. I want to pray for everyone that's made this decision, whether it's the first time or, or maybe it was more than the first time. But I, I pray that your grace would just permeate our lives through and through. And, and do a work in us. Father, we worship you. We thank you for everything. You're the only reason we have anything. And everyone said, Amen.